Good morning. My name is Jessica Dumas from Prime Image Life Coaching, but welcome to Insights Inc. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm a professional life coach. I have an online life coaching program called My Prime Image, and I help entrepreneurs and business professionals find the right energy in their business so that they're they're running their business and their business is not running them. So helping uh, business professionals with website, online, uh, social media, that sort of stuff, but also to uh, to you know, get that right energy and running their business again. I'm also the creator of a one day workshop I call Indigenous Insight Seminars. And I do this work to help educate Canadians on the history of Indigenous Canada or uh, the Indigenous Renaissance, which I'm calling this time right now. And uh, it's really an opportunity for Canada as a whole to be talking about truth and reconciliation. So uh, the fastest growing population in Canada is the Indigenous community and a high population area here in Manitoba. And I always share that I'm I'm very lucky and very blessed to, in the networks that I get to be in, I'm meeting so many incredible people. And I've always been uh, engaged in working with youth and helping them find their skill to create the the life that they want and I think that it's it's always a really important time to work with youth inspire youth and uh, and to demonstrate what your community can do but I think never more a stronger time than right now with that fastest growing population so um, I'm connecting with incredible leaders in the community business uh, entertainment culture and uh, really to create more of that knowledge base, to create a, um, a network of truth and reconciliation and really putting that focus on the truth before we get to reconciliation. But I wanted to share today, um, I'm inviting with me someone who is doing that already in his work, um, showing that commitment to youth and mentorship, which is something that I'm so passionate about. And uh, and so I'm really excited, and I'm going to invite in uh, Mr. Hawaka White Cloud. So let me bring you up here. Now, why is that not working? There he is. Good morning. Yes, Hi. I'm amazing in yourself. I'm doing great, thank you. So I wanted to mention that. Um, so I wanted to introduce Hawaka, who I believe is a trailblazer. He's someone who's creating opportunities for mentorship and supporting youth in more ways than one. So Hawaka is from uh, Sioux Valley, Dakota Nation. He's an Asper graduate. He's the regional manager of a program called In Business. He's a skateboarder. And I also wanted to just mention that he's the husband to a very beautiful woman, Tessa Blakey White Cloud. Yeah. And uh, definitely want to make sure that we send a shout out to her. But thank you so much for joining me. Uh, you shared that this is your week off of work, so you're just enjoying yourself at home. But thank you so much. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Right after this, I'm going to take off to the cottage. <laughs> it's a long weekend, so you should definitely be, be doing totally. So, um, So the first time that we met was at Nietzsche Commons, and I was the chairperson for the Aboriginal Chamber of Commerce. And you yeah. came with one of your associates from the in-business program and wanted to, uh, I don't know if that was when you were first just coming to Winnipeg with the program or That's correct. Uh, or where that was, but I was mm -hmm. so excited to hear about this work that you were doing. So please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure. So uh, like I'll follow in the footsteps of my buddy Wab and introduce myself in Dakota. So I would say Hawaka Imakiapi Blakey White Cloud Tioshpae. Which means my name is Hawaka. And for those of you who don't know, Hawaka in the Dakota language means Northern Lights. And I belong to the families of both Blakey and White Cloud. And my family lives in Sioux Valley, Dakota Nation. And so right now I'm the regional manager of In Business, which is a national business mentorship program for Indigenous high school youth. So my mandate is to recruit 60 Indigenous uh, high school youth from across Manitoba, Saskatchewan. And then re also recruit at the same time indigenous business mentors. So those who have post-secondary uh, in post-secondary ed education as well as uh, business in some sort of capacity. And uh, I bring them together for a conference and they're paired up in groups and then they're put together in groups on Facebook. And then every two weeks, the mentors will give the students pre-generated challenges 
that uh, you know challenge them to think about business in ways they might necess not necessarily thought of prior. And then myself and the mentor will provide them feedback, and that goes on for about uh, six to eight months. And then we culminate with a closing conference where they participate in some uh, ac you know some business uh, presentations and activities. And then they get a certificate. And then uh, I keep in touch with them, and I try to provide them with volunteer opportunities, job opportunities as they as they come forward. So that's what I do in my professional life. And then in my personal life, I'm also the co-owner of a production company called Wakam Productions, which focuses on producing mini documentaries on urban indigenous identity with a focus on skateboarding because I'm a skateboarder. <laughs> and so I've done two pieces for CBC, one on indigenous people reclaiming land through skateboarding, another on my friend's company out of Regina called Colonialism Skateboards. And that company teaches the history of colonialism in Canada, but using skateboard graphics. And then right now, um, we're just getting geared up to produce a series for APTN over the summer on indigenous lands and skateboarding communities that are growing there. And so, yeah, so that'll be shot over the summer. And it's a webisode series. And I believe it's APTN's first crack at uh, producing a webisode series. And so we're the pilot for that. So I'm really looking forward to that. I just bought a drone a couple of days ago been playing with it in the backyard <laughs> yeah and then uh on the side too tessa and myself uh, tessa my wife we do um reconciliation workshops as well too uh, mainly focusing on the blanket exercise and then kind of talking about how you know uh you know indigenous and non-indigenous need to come together in reconciliation and tessa kind of speaks from the non-indigenous side saying that you know for settlers for canadian settlers when they hear this history you know they're not responsible for this for the history but they are response able to respond to that history. And so that's the message we bring forward. So those are the three kind of parts of my life right now. Beautiful, thank you for sharing that. I love how you're you're using technology to engage with the youth and, and then the skateboarding because that's gonna attract young people, right? Cause they're gonna be like, who's this guy and what is he doing with the camera? Oh, I hope so. I, you know, sometimes I think, oh, they probably just look at me and think, who's this old guy trying to, you know, be all cool with skateboarding? <laughs> no, you don't look at old. old <laughs> So, so tell me about that. How long have you been skateboarding and, and how do you connect to indigenous culture through your skateboarding? Right, so I've been skateboarding since I was 17 and I'll be 31 at the end of June, so almost 14 years now. And uh, I think, I guess to start it off like from the beginning, um, like the first peoples to use a board to explore the land and their surroundings were um, the indigenous people of Hawaii, which was the Polynesian people. Mm -hmm. But they they had it from a um, they took it as a very spiritual act, right? Like they they had uh, you know a medicine person that they would go to. They you know say hey like I'd like to begin surfing. The medicine person would hold a ceremony for them. They would have to go out and find a specific tree that they liked or or one that they felt connected to. Then they would bring it back, create a board from it. They would bless that board, and then they would be able to go out and uh, you know hang out with their their family or you know their group and uh, you know explore the land, hang out with their friends, have a good time, mentor each other. And just live in a good way and so from that uh you know somebody got the idea to bolt some wheels to uh to a board and yeah. uh when skateboarding first came out it was called it was referred to as sidewalk surfing and so the whole style um that emerged at the time was taken straight from surfing right so straight from that polynesian culture and now i mean you know it's 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 a global it's a global phenomenon right and so when i think about skateboarding though i think about it in terms of um like there's definitely mentorship aspects. I mean, I get to hang out outside with my friends all the time. And uh, and then on top of that, I mean, like it also includes like um, getting interested in, in photography, videography, which is what I'm into now, right? And I would have never been interested in that had it not been for skateboarding. Um, and so for myself, when I was growing up, you know, I, I graduated high school and uh, I'd always wanted to, because I grew up in the South end of Winnipeg and there weren't that many indigenous people around me, like from, at my high school, I was one of three visible Indigenous people that I knew of, right? Mm -hmm. But none of them were skateboarders. But uh, it wasn't until we got, I was able to get, get on YouTube and connect with other skateboarders in Manitoba that I saw that, hey, there's other Indigenous skateboarders. And I should, you know, I should connect with them and see if we have, you know, if we share common interests, common stories. And right away, I mean, you know, we do. And it's, and it's interesting to, to see how there's a culture that's shared between us that we can connect through. Um, you know, from, you know, our fam like even things from like family. So like in indigenous families, right? Like we don't call second cousins or third cousins or, or whatever, right? Everyone's just family. And yeah. so connecting in that way, um, you know, and, and just sharing kind of different 
creation stories, belief stories, um, you know, spiritual beliefs, all that. All that, you know, I was able to connect with them, and uh, which I wasn't able to do with others. And so, yeah, I, I was really able to connect with the indigenous community in that way. And so I just wanted to do skateboarding. And then uh, we started up a clothing company, board company. That went good for a while. And then didn't want to do that anymore because I wanted to get paid for skateboarding somehow. So I started to do media production. And so that's where we're at now. Yeah. Very exciting. Um, board using a board to explore the land. I've mm -hmm. never heard that before. So that's really incredible. Cause I remember seeing it, you know, maybe it was on the news, maybe it was on Facebook and seeing you talking about skateboarding and connecting to culture. So I've been curious, like how, what is he doing? Right. What is his story? So that's incredible. Thanks so much. Yeah. Well, I think what's really cool about skateboarding is it's like, it's like an individual act in itself, but I mean, you know, you can skate by yourself, but I mean, you can also skate with a group of people too. Right. Yeah. And so the fact that you can do it alone or you can do it in a group kind of makes it its own uh, activity that's really fun. You know, you can look at it as a sport. You can compete with others or you can look at it as a just straight art, just you doing something. Or you can add video photography into it. That yeah. creates something else. Um, and then, you know, just the just how it's not solely set on competition, that it's, you know, you're, people are encouraging you to push yourself as as best you can, right? And so that's really what I found really cool about it is that, uh, you know, like the older ones always tried to encourage the younger ones. And I just was immediately attracted to that, right? Cause it was somebody who I'd looked up to cause it was like, oh, you're really good at skateboarding. And, but they were really pushing me to push myself. And so, yeah, now I'm in it. Now I'm the older guy pushing the younger ones, right? And so <laughs> not only do I get to push them in terms of skateboarding, but I also get the terms of them and push of, you know, what is your professionalism, you know? Do you have a resume? You know, like <laughs> I'm always kind of just, you know, in the skate park, kind of be like, hey, you know, are you interested in video production? Because you can help me out on these, you know, projects I'm working on. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love it. That's amazing. Yeah. So, and then I, will, I definitely want to talk about the mentorship with the in business program because sure. when I heard about it, I was like, that is incredible. I love it, and uh, we really need to connect with youth to first of all, show them what their opportunities are, right? Because mm -hmm. um, people who are coming from First Nation communities, the majority of what they see are social workers, police officers, teachers, right? Correct. We need those in the community. That's or that's who's more present in the community. So 50% of indigenous people are living off of reserve, right? In Manitoba. Mm -hmm. And so we're connecting with a lot of them, uh, creating more opportunities to do that. And so the in-business, program how do you connect with the youth like how do you recruit them and uh, and then what are you seeing as the outcomes of the program yeah so just as you mentioned right like youth often don't have the opportunity to engage with you know people in the community other than you know teachers social workers right and so that's uh like that's a concept called social annihilation and whereby youth because they don't engage with these people they write themselves off of those as uh, of those opportunities for themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's one way the program works at combating that. Another is uh, a concept called social erasure, and uh, you know that's where Indigenous people are just erased from the from Canadian history, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's another way this um, program also seeks to kind of bridge that gap as well, too, right? So not only like can we present you with you know an Indigenous person who has a post secondary education who has a, who has engaged in business. But there's others who have as well too, right? And we'll explore them through the narrative of this program. So my goal is that I go either into high schools doing presentations or I, you know, or engage with living libraries. I just did one with the University of Manitoba last week. That went really well. So I recruited a couple students there. Um, you know, even if it's through word of mouth, I'll recruit them there. Um, a lot of the times too, I'll push them to our website, which is cbuinbusiness.ca. And that is where they can um, apply online as well, too. And so, yeah, so I just go around recruiting uh, young Indigenous students. Um, or even sometimes, you know, when I do that, the reconciliation workshops with my wife, I'm like, I tell everybody at the workshop, hey, if you know anybody who's interested, you know, they can apply, they can apply there as well, too. Yeah, so that's recruiting the students. And then on terms of recruiting the business uh, mentors, that one has been primarily through my personal networks. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so like my friend Graham, like he was the first uh, mentor I recruited. He's actually a video editor for the TRCM. So the Truth and Reconciliation Center of Manitoba, right? The Treaty Relations Commission? Pre no, no. The, 
the, the center now that that's at the University oh, of Manitoba. The National Center of Truth and Reconciliation. Yes, the NCTR. Sorry. Yes, that's correct. That's yeah. So many acronyms. Right. Right. Yeah, and changing and never changing. Yeah. So he was the first one because he had, uh, you know, he had gotten a, or um, he had gone to River River College and completed their uh, digital multimedia program, and uh, he'd also. Because of that, he'd also been able to do, you know, side contracts in videography and photography. So right away, I was the free, he was, and he's also a skateboarder too, right? So I touched, I asked him. He said, "Yeah, let's do it." So he was in. Um, I had a couple, you know, fellow classmates that I graduated from the after school business. I roped them in, and then I kind of just put feelers out in the community and said, "Hey, like, is anybody else interested?" Um, I got a mentor this year from the Paw Manitoba. Um, it was actually a student that I'd met at um, the International Peace Gardens. Have you ever been to the International Peace Gardens? No, I meant to, and I've never gone, so I'll make a point this summer. I had never been there, uh, you know, prior, like I never even knew it existed. I'd always, but I'd always pass through the gate and like, then you just turn right and there's an International Peace Gardens, right? And so it's just, it's right on the border, like half of it's on the U.S. side, half of it's on the Canadian side. Right. And we and we had done uh, a workshop with um, like these high school students that were kind of like the top high school students in Manitoba and so we'd done a blanket exercise with them there was about 300 it was one of the biggest blanket exercises we've ever done um, and we're actually going to do one on July I believe second and third at the International Peace Gardens as part of kind of like a like an off-site celebration or not even celebration or acknowledgement of the colonization of the lands right so you know we got Canada 150 we got you know July in, in Independence Day in the in the United States. So what about acknowledging, you know, this other side of history, right? So we're going to do a blanket exercise and we're going to do it right on the, you know, on the border. So when in the blanket exercise, you know, when the borders get cut off, it'll be right at the border, right? Wow. Yeah. And I mean, that's especially personal for me too, because, you know, for Dakota people, that's what happened, right? You know, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't see our family anymore down there and we were just cut off from them, right? Yeah. yeah. So... So, so yeah, I recruited a student from there and then, you know, I've somehow I got in touch with her mom and her mom had also been through, you know, some business, uh, post-secondary business education up North and she was interested in being a mentor. So I got her in and then I got a couple, uh, mentors from Saskatoon, uh, Roger Grona, he's with Firebird Consulting. He was in right away and he's been awesome. And then another one, Kathleen Makala, she's with the law school. Um, and, but she's had previous experience doing human resources. So. Yeah, just a myriad of people who are all interested in kind of pushing students and getting them interested in business. Nice. That's so that's so great. I love that that program's going on and I, I like that it's continuing. Mm -hmm. So what are you seeing from the outcomes? Like when the students are done uh, and are they high school students? Have you seen people starting business or they're at least going into business education or what are you seeing? Yeah, so right off the bat, I mean, a third, so 75% of our students do go on to post-secondary. And then about half of them go on and, and study business. And so, yeah, so that's that's really awesome. Um, we had a couple students who have started their own businesses, um, but you know, they had they had started them or or they had ideas of it prior to the program. So I can't take credit for that one. <laughs> um, yeah, and then like I even help, uh, you know, well, I try and help as best I can to support students who are uh, at the Children of the Earth High School. And they have a program with Seed uh, Winnipeg where they have a cooperative uh, business where they take art from the art class and they sell it at art shows. Um, and they just had one at Nietzsche Commons last Friday. So I went and checked that out, you know, try to support the students. But then I had to get to another event. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's great. I've uh, I've connected with that group in the past before. And it's it's so nice to see to see the youth being mentored like that and given those opportunities. Yeah. And just, you know, and then seeing them take it and seeing them, you know, step outside their comfort zone and just really pushing themselves and yeah. gaining that experience. Yeah. No, I'm really, I'm really happy for those guys and yeah, they're doing really well, but yeah. So overall, like from what I hear from like, um, so that's, you know, from the student side, but from the educator side, you know, from, you know, counselors or, or, or whomever, you know, who, who have been contacts at schools, you know, the, the feedback that I've gotten is that, you know, wow, this, you know, this really changed the student, you know, the student sees themselves as a professional now, they want to go to university, or they want to go to college, they're interested in business, you know, it's just, and I'm just like, oh, right, awesome, like, that's what this program is supposed to do, right, and so it's, it's just, uh, it's intrinsically, you know, valuable to hear that stuff, right, because it's like, yeah, <laughs> we're making a difference, yeah. Good for you. I'm, I'm. I have no doubt that you are. So, talk a little bit about your your personal uh, and professional journey. So, being a young Indigenous man in Winnipeg, 
growing up in an area that's not a lot of indigenous people mm -hmm. and now to where you are. So what, what was childhood like for you? What was teenagehood like for you? Uh, so it was like, I moved here when I was five. Um, Cause my dad had been with uh, you know, INAC for a bit. And so he moved around and eventually he settled in Winnipeg and he'd gone on to Ottawa, but my mom didn't want to move because you know, her family's right here in Sioux Valley. Um, so I stayed in the city. Uh, I first went to Laura Secord in Wolseley. And I think that was a good experience because, you know, not only was I put into French immersion, but I was put in an inner, like kind of in an inner city. So like it was people of all backgrounds, right? Like immigrants, newcomers, um, you know, just all different kinds of people were, you know, all kinds of different little students that I was able to engage with. And so I think that got me, uh, that gave me a good perspective because then once we moved to St. Vital and then I started going here to St. Vital, like it was, it was not like that, right? It was all kind of predominantly, you know, non-Indigenous, you know, they were settler identified, you know. Uh, yeah, it was, it was different. And I, I miss Laura Secord, right? Because I miss that kind of, you know, learning from all different people and hearing about their cultures, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, went to Collège Jean Sauvé after that, you know, got started in skateboarding, got started in snow skating, which is uh, skateboarding on the snow, just because we don't have any hills, right? And, uh, <laughs> And I was able to touch, and then the, what was really cool is the Forks uh, began building a snowboard park. And I used to go there every day because it was amazing. Like it was a little treasure in the middle of our city. And uh, I finally got in touch with the creator of the, of the park or the, or the producer of the park. And so then I helped build and design that park for 10 years. And yeah, and, and helping maintain it. And it, like, that's how, I, that's how I spent almost every day of my winter was outside hanging out with my friends, like, yeah, again, like, you know, using a board to explore the land, have a good time, you know, uh, and just hanging out outside because who else wants to go hang out, you know, minus 40, right? But I was like, that's okay. I can just dress up and I'll get warm, right? <laughs> yeah. So that was really awesome. Uh, and that guy actually went on to become a skate park designer for Barkman Skate Parks. And they helped produce, you know, several skate parks across Winnipeg and Manitoba. And then he moved on to BC where he now, where then he started working for New Line Skate Parks, but uh, I don't know, that's a completely other story. But he was a he was a big mentor. His name's Andrew Conrad, and he was actually a, one of the best men at my wedding too. So he was a big mentor to me, giving me that opportunity. Um, so then I went to university, and uh, I think the best part about you know when people ask me, oh, why did you go to the University of Manitoba, or what made you want to choose business? You know, I just well, one, I went to the University of Manitoba because my mom works there, so I knew I could get a ride to school, right? <laughs> so she teaches law uh, and runs the academic support program for the law school there. And then business, like, you know, you go to university one and you're supposed to, you know, take little bits of everything. And then finally, you know, you're, you're supposed to have, you know, an epiphany and you go on to a faculty, right? Well, my epiphany never came. And I was like, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, and then I saw a poster for this, you know, in, at this indigenous uh, academic support program at the Asper School of Business. And I thought, business, I, I'll probably make money doing that, right? So that's how I got into business and I went and met with them and then they gave me like a course list of everything that I'll, I, that I'd need to do over the next, you know, few years. And so I said, yep, yeah, I'll do that. So nice. that's how I got sucked into that. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I took uh, the entrepreneurship stream. So like in your fourth year, you get to choose a stream. So I chose entrepreneurship. And so I started a business plan to one, create a skateboard shop. Cause I'd always wanted to do one of those, like a retail skateboard shop. And then two, I wanted to always have a television series. So I wrote a uh, business plan and got a good mark for that. And then um, I'd always wanted to do it. So I'd always been kind of working on it on the side. And then I started working for the University of Manitoba doing recruitment for the Asper School of Business for their academic, uh, their indigenous academic support program. I left that and then I started to work on a project for APTN. And that was the first time, uh, you know, it actually got the green light from uh, APTN to do a series. And so I was working with uh, Jesse Green at Strong Front and, uh, this guy named Gary at Rocky Point Productions, who's now my business partner in my company, Wacom Productions. And so, you know, we were going to have this, this television series. And I was really stoked because I was like, yes, this is, you know, my dream. And then uh, it was up to the Canadian Media Fund to give us the green light because APTN had already given us the green light. And so we we're like, yeah, you know, here we are. We're good to go. And then the CMF said no, like at the last second. And I was like, oh. Well, I was about to get paid and, you know, work for the next six months. So I got to get a job. So then I applied to Canada Post and I became a mail carrier for a month. I delivered mail for a month and it was amazing. Like it was, I can't believe those guys got paid to do that every day. Cause they just walked through, like I would just walk around. People would, you know, be really happy to see me. You know, old folks would go, you know, we support you. And I'd go, yes, thank you so much. You know, I, I don't care. 
<laughs> so yeah, like it was awesome because you just walk around and like because you're walking around like and again you're exploring the land like and because you're getting you know warmed up like it didn't matter if it was raining snowing like I was good to go at all times. Um, but you know I see I see why you know there's a pushback against those community mailboxes. I don't know if you have one, but you have to you know get the key, open it, right? Yeah. Those are the worst because I'm a tall person too, right? So I'm just like, I got to bend down and it's, even if it's super cold out, like you're just standing there like freezing, right? And so luckily um, by around that time, uh, my friend who was the associate vice president at the University of Winnipeg, Wapkanu, he had established a relationship with Cape Breton University through the In Business program because he had gone there and uh, made a presentation, uh, you know, did like a mini concert for the students out there. And so when... Cape Breton had applied to go national with this program and applied to get federal funding. Uh, you know, they approached Wab and Wab said, yeah, yeah, bring it here. And they were like, okay, well, we need to recruit, you know, a local regional manager. Do you know of anybody? And so I'm sure he tapped other people, but he also tapped me and uh, yeah. And so I applied and, and uh, got the job. And then the second day of the job, uh, he took me to a speaking engagement that he was doing for the superintendents of Manitoba. And I just happened to sit beside this young lady who, you know, was like, oh, you're trying to get into high schools? Well, I can help you. Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, well, I really like skateboarding. Here's a video of me getting hit in the face with a skateboard recently that went viral. And so I tagged her in it. And, uh, you know, we had lunch together. And I thought I'd never see her again. Um, but uh, later that day, she, you know, Instagram just got direct messages. Yeah. And so she sent me a direct message saying, hey, like, I think you're, you know, I think you're really smart and handsome. Like, you know, we should hang out sometime. And I was like, oh, yes, we should. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so then we hung out, and uh, around that time too, I had I've always been reading blogs and and uh, you know kind of life hacks, right? So just things to try and make your life uh, a little easier, a little more interesting. And one of them was, uh, you know, a question that said, you know, if you really want to get to know somebody, you should ask them forty three questions. And so on our first date, you know, I asked her forty three questions, and uh, she blew me away. So then I said, well, let me ask you another hundred questions, you know. And they range from, you know, what would your favorite, uh, you know, vacation be, you know, to you know. What, what do you think about children? And uh, yeah, she blew me away. So then four months later, I said, marry me. Oh, yeah. And then she also let it slip that like her dad was like a minister, right? So I was like, oh, I better play it, you know, I better play cool on this one. So I asked her to marry me. And then eight months later, we got married. Wow, that's beautiful. I love love stories. I don't know if you knew that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And so then we got married at the Forks. We had the first um, public wedding ceremony at the Forks. So anybody who was walking by was welcome to attend. So we had a couple old ladies who were walking by. They sat down and go, Ooh, you know, Aww. and then um, it was the first one underneath the, the stage, the red stage there. So it was the first for that. And then as far as we knew, it was the first half United Church, half traditional Dakota ceremony. So, you know, we did kind of the vows, the ring exchange, but then we also had um, like a Dakota blanket ceremony where both Tess and I were wrapped in our, um, our, our marriage blanket, uh, and, uh, you know, recognizing that both our families were coming together at that time. Yeah. Beautiful. So we did that. Yeah. And so then it was officiated by Tess's dad, uh, and then my mother, who's a Dakota elder. Yeah. Very nice. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And so then we started doing the blanket exercise together. I started doing more production stuff because Gary, who had worked with me on that previous, um, at previous production said, Hey, like, are we still going to do any more skateboard stuff? And I was like, yeah, sure. I'm interested. He's cool. We'll, we'll start our own bit or we'll start our own business together. And so that's what we started walk on productions last June. And, uh, yeah, everything's going really well. I'm really happy with life. Good yeah. for you. That's excellent to hear. So I want to hear a little bit about, um, your connection to culture. So moving to the city when you were a child, has your family always remained really strong in culture? Is that been something that you've just been brought up in or did you have to find your own journey to discovering that for yourself? Uh, that was definitely my own journey to discovering it for myself. I mean, my dad was always, cause my dad, like, well, I, like in order to tell like the story of myself, like I kind of have to give like a brief overview of my parents. So like my dad lived in the bush until he was nine years old, only speaking Anishinaabe. Right. So he lived with his grandparents and they just hunted and gathered his like sole role, um, you know, as a young child was starting the fire every morning. Right. So that was his responsibility. And uh, yeah. And so then eventually when he was nine years old, you know, somebody came into the bush and said, hey, you know, this young man has to go to school. <laughs> and so then he, he went to school and then his mother had to catch him up. Right. In terms of, you know, writing, uh, speaking English. Yeah. And so that was kind of his journey. And then my mother, on the other hand, 
she grew up with her grandparents as well, but until about the age of five. And, uh, and she grew up, you know, with her grandmothers and they were around that time, like from what I understand, there were no uh, older men around, like there were no grandfathers. Mm -hmm. And so these two grandmothers lived together and they raised my mom. And like, again, they hunted and gathered as well too, right? So everything that they ate, they hunted themselves, right? So, you know, I guess she, the, my mom used to ask, you know, oh, what are we eating? And, you know, her grandmother would say, oh, we're eating chicken, but they would be eating skunk, right? <laughs> right? Uh, so, so they had like some really cool upbr upbringings that uh, like I'll never know about, right? But like, I'm trying to get them both to kind of, in I've interviewed them and, you know, I'm trying to get my mom to write a book as well too. And so when my mom, uh, you know, went back to her family, it sounded like she wasn't like really invited back as like, you know, a daughter. She was more invited back as a worker because they had like my, uh, my grandfather had a farm, right? And then he was a World War veteran too. And so he had some PTSD issues as well too. And so she eventually, you know, as, through growing up on the farm, you know, figured that I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Like, and I think education is the only way I'm going to get through this. And so she went to high school. She was one of the first batches of students who um, weren't going to residential school, but they went to high school like in Brandon. And so, you know, I guess they were the first, it was one of the first times too that Brandon had received like indigenous people right near them. So of course, you know, it was like, Oh, look at those Indians. Right. Mm -hmm. And so she had to, ex she had to experience that as well too. But she was lucky because she had met some people um, who she, who she boarded with. So she didn't live on the reserve, but she lived in town with a family. And this one family after she had graduated moved to Calgary and they said, you know, if you ever want to, moved to Calgary, like we have a place for you. And so she had applied to a couple of universities, including University of Calgary. She got accepted at the University of Calgary and moved uh, moved to Calgary. And she got a degree, I believe, in history. And then um, she had, there was a program that, uh, I guess at like their, their Indigenous Student Center or somewhere on campus, there was a poster that said, hey, like if you're interested in, if you're an Indigenous person interested in journalism, apply to here and you can go to Ottawa and have an opportunity to study journalism. So. She said, sure, right? Like I saw a poster that said indigenous, you know, something, opportunity. Yeah, I'll do it. And uh, she went and uh, did that for the summer, but then got another job in Ottawa. And then at the same time, my dad was working in Ottawa. And so that's how they met. And then both of them um, kind of, you know, said like, you know, this isn't what we want to do for the rest of our lives. We should, you know, get more education. So then they both went to law school and both got their law degrees. My father went to work for INAC and my mother went to work for Tyndanega for a bit. Um, for the, uh, you know, helping them out do kind of running their business uh, stuff, um, from what I understand, kind of just helping them. I'm not actually quite sure what she did. No, I'm just BSing, but uh, she did something important. And uh, yeah, so then we moved around and then finally we settled in Winnipeg here. Yeah, but what was the question about myself though? <laughs> right, my culture, my culture. Okay, so, that, so that's my parents, right. And so my dad was always kind of into culture, like, you know, but, not so much though, because like he, like even to this day, like when I asked him to speak in Anishinaabe, like he doesn't, he kind of recalls like a little bit. He's like, oh yeah, I remember bears, makwa, but it's pretty well gone, right? My mother knows Dakota pretty well though. Actually, I just learned, I, like I was, uh, I was, I saw, oh yeah. Have you ever, how about this? Have, as a caveat, have you ever seen a crow poop? No, can't say right. that. Right. I've seen seagulls. I've seen other birds, but I've never seen a crow poop. And <laughs> And so anyway, that thought came to me. And then I asked her, you know, what is, uh, you know, what is crow in Dakota? And she said, it's uh, which means, which directly translates to uh, like a bad mother-in-law. And I thought, is that really the definition? And so I went, you know, online because there's an online dictionary for uh, English Dakota. And that is the, that is a literal translation, like a bad mother-in-law. So I'm not sure what came first, like, you know, the crow <laughs> is a bad mother-in-law or like bad mother-in-law. And then, you know, oh, that's the crow, right? Yeah, so it's interesting to hear, like, when you start learning a language, kind of, you know, what, how descriptionary it is, you get a little bit of taste of the history and kind of how, you know, our people were thinking and, uh, like, even when it comes to, like, March, I forget, like, I forget the name of March, but it literally translates to the month of snow blindness. And, you know, from recent years, I mean, March has been literally, like, no snow, right? And so we get to see the effects of climate change, right? Yeah. So, but in terms of, like, the culture growing up with it, yeah, like... Not so much. I mean, I think my first, like, uh, my first sweat I went to when I was 10, although, like, that was my first sweat in Sioux Valley. And, like, I saw, I went to a sweat and I saw lights in it, like flashing lights inside the, inside the sweat. And, uh, you know, I was like, why do you, why did you guys install lights inside the sweat? Like, <laughs> like, it's crazy, but, you know, but, 
but uh, why? And they were like, no, there's no lights. And so, of course, I went back and there were no lights. And I was like, oh, interesting, right? <laughs> Uh, and then I, my dad took me to a couple sweats too, but I wasn't really super like, oh, this is, you know, this is me. This is something that, uh, you know, this is something that defines me. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't really till I met uh, Wob that I was really inspired to kind of learn the language and uh, get back to, you know, figuring that side of myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then I started learning the language more, you know, now that I can introduce myself and, and uh, you know, speak a bit. Like I'm like a toddler in terms of the Dakota language. Like I know my numbers, colors. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's about all I know about culture. Great. Yeah, no, good. But then, I mean, I, ha- I have to mention too, like my father-in-law, he recently gifted me uh, a pipe as well too, uh, about six months ago. So yeah, so I'm on my way trying to figure it out, but just on my own. And I have my mom to guide me, but she never wanted to kind of push that on me. She just wanted to let me figure it out for myself. Yeah, and I'm thankful for that. Yeah, definitely. It's an interesting journey. I mean, I know that I'm for the same for the same thing, right? As an adult, the first time I started connecting with my culture was working with uh, an, an indigenous organization where we had an elder in the office, and I was like, "We have an elder in the office, like what?" <laughs> and uh, but it was the first time that I started to feel like I belonged. Was working mm-hmm. with an indigenous organization with indigenous people, and and so it was really amazing. So. I know that, um, so we, we were in a meeting together, I don't know if it was four or six weeks ago, and we had a conversation. I've been trying to remember what it was. I still can't remember what it was, but I do know that it had to do with some of the, uh, the phrases or the, um, I guess, the titles of actions that you talk about. And, and it's, it's just, it's the education. So, for example, earlier in the conversation, you used the term Social annihilation. I can't even annihilation. Say annihilation. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and then social erase erasure. erasure. Yeah. So, so where did you learn this stuff, and and what does that do for you? I mean, I know it's valuable knowledge, and I I want to learn more about that. Yeah. So those were concepts uh, that, like, I'd always kind of like felt, but I wasn't able to verbalize until, um, like, I started talking about it with Tessa, right? So Tessa's background, she has a degree in sociology, and then she went on to get her master's in political economy. And so she kind of has a strong background in academia, right? And so in talking with her about this, you know, she was the one who was like, yeah, well, that's social erasure and that's social annihilation. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, cool. Right. And so then I can just talk about it in those ways. Yeah. And then, I mean, that's partly why I married her, right? Like, I was just like, man, like, you're so smart. Like, please, like, don't leave me. Like, (laughs) (laughs) I hope she likes that. (laughs) And you know what? I I just, I want to share that um, you have a beautiful aura around you. And I've met you with your wife and she's beautiful as well. And I think together you both really demonstrate healthy relationships in so many levels, healthy relationships from an indigenous perspective, right? Honoring your wife, taking her name. So you became Blakey White Cloud. Yeah. So that was, I mean, and that's new. You, see, I've probably met one or two other men who have done that. And the majority of men are like, yeah, right. Like that's mm. not gonna happen. So, I mean, that's just a beautiful honor. And yeah. I, even in her family, it's probably the first time that she's seen that. Is that true or? Uh, I don't know, but probably. I mean, yeah, I don't, like, I don't think that's a thing that, you know, most, you know, people do, right? And the reason why I did that is because, you know, for Dakota people, we we're a matrilineal society, right? So women were always the heads of households. And so, you know, when I was going to get married, I thought, well, I better, you know, I better pull solid here and said, you know, I'll take your last name. And she said, no, well, you know, you're Indigenous and like, we should be honoring that side of you. So, you know, you can keep your last name, but, you know, take my last name as your middle name. And so I got rid of my middle names, which are like Raymond Peter, Peter Hatfield, which is like, Raymond Hatfield's my dad's name, right? So he's gone. And then my grandfather's name was Peter, so he's gone. So now it's Blakey. Yeah. Oh, good for you. Yeah, beautiful. And I'm I'm inspired by the work that you are doing in the programs that you're doing, in the work that you're doing on your own, because it's inspiring youth. And and to me, like that's that's our purpose in life is to really inspire and connect with youth to let them know that they can do it. Right. And and that I mean on so many levels, like we're, we're just the same. We're all the same. We're trying to make it, but we're making it together. And that's, that's the best way to make it happen and not by tearing each other down, which is, you know, unfortunately sometimes things that we see in the community. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, on top of that too, like I married into political family as well too, right? So her father was like one of the longest standing uh, members of parliament for the NDP. And he was voted like a top parliamentarian by the other by the other members of parliament, I think in 97. So he was on the cover of McLean. So that's how, that's how I think everyone knows him. Because yeah. then, you know, anytime I say, you know, Hawaka Blakey Waikawa, they're like, oh, are you related to Bill? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> right, prior to marrying in, like I had no clue, right? But but now that I know, I mean, now that I know, like I've already gotten sucked into like uh, my brother-in-law's campaign for when he be, wanted to be, become a member of parliament, uh, you know, in the past federal election, which I helped out on, you know, doing the marketing for him and then also, you know, scrutineering and, and whatever else was asked of me, but he he was successful in his election, and then also helping Wab when he wanted to run for uh, you know the Mani member of the Legislative Assembly for Manitoba, so helping him do that. And right now, Tessa just took a leave of absence from her full time role as a fund developer for outreach sites here in Winnipeg that uh, you know support Winnipeg's under love to now being the campaign manager for Wab's uh, leadership bid for the Manitoba NDP, and so. You know, getting sucked into the politics, you know, like I'd never had any experience with any of that. And uh, I see that also that's an important uh, aspect that we as Indigenous people are. I think all people should be, you know, invested in is, is being involved in politics because like people want to see change, but they often don't want to work towards it. And uh, like, I think it's hard because you're never going to see like an immediate change, which I think is what everybody wants to see. Right. Yeah. Is And I think you have to believe in like the power of incremental change mm -hmm. and where that's, you know, you're going to have to just tip tip it just a little bit so, you know, we can start going on a different direction. So I'm working in that way too. And, you know, I just actually got a friend of mine who is also interested in doing video production. He's actually going up to Nelson house today with Wob to do some video. Yeah. To help him on his leadership bid. And he's actually, he said he's never volunteered in his life. <laughs> and so here he is, right. Going up to Nelson house, doing video production, helping my friend, uh, you know, with his leadership bid for the NDP. Yeah. So I also think that's an important piece too. Yeah, no, and you know what? I, I like that you said that politics, very important and valuable and volunteering. I love that you said that too, and mm -hmm. incremental change because I spent so many years volunteering and I and I still do. I contribute in many different ways with many different organizations and youth. And uh, and I've gained so much skills. I've gained such a wide network. And uh, and I it's just, it's such a valuable component to life that I think people should not uh, dismiss, right? Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. So um, thank you for your time. I've, I feel like I've taken up a lot of your time. So how can people reach you? So I, I shared your um, uh, DB White Cloud on Twitter and Instagram. HB White Cloud. Okay. And uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and, <TV. laughs> uh, and so how else would you say get in touch with you? So if youth want to get in touch with you to say, hey, I want to be part of the in business program, they can go to. Yeah, I think Facebook's like kind of like the best one to reach me at. Like if you just look up HB White Cloud, like, you know, Facebook.com slash HB White Cloud. That's a good way awesome. to reach out to me on Instagram, Twitter. I mean, like, my, you know, my my personal information, like my email and phone number, that's also on the web. You know, you just have to Google me, boom. And I think it's like the first thing that comes up. Call me, email me. I'm always, you know, willing to take the time to chat like we're doing today. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you again. And like I said, I, I just admire the work that you're doing. I think you're a beautiful person and uh, your energy is, you know, it's flowing. So good for you and keep up the amazing work. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate okay. it. Talk to you soon. Okay. Peace. Bye. How do I hang up here? Uh, yeah, I don't know I hang up. What if I just close? Oh, no, I can just close this. Okay. Peace. <laughs> Bye. Well, that was Hawaki Blakey White Cloud, amazing man doing amazing things in our community in the city of Winnipeg. So uh, HB White Cloud on, did I say that right again? HB White Cloud. So thank you so much. Uh, this is Insights Inc. Every week, 10 a.m., I'm sharing a new interview, collecting that knowledge, supporting youth, creating a network of truth and reconciliation. So thank you so much for watching. Um, if you are interested in signing up for my newsletter, you can do that at jessicadumas.com and I'll let you know who we're talking with next week and why we're talking to them. And you're always welcome to join us live and ask some questions, be a part of the conversation and, and learn more and definitely connect if you have any questions or if you have anyone in mind that you want me to connect with. I'm really excited that in a couple of weeks I'm going to be speaking with uh, a representative of the water that we use in uh, in the city of Winnipeg. So 
that's, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of information we're going to talk about and really great and amazing things in this time of truth and reconciliation. So thank you so much and please share this video. So talk to you soon. Bye.